Okie dokie, let's kick off then. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Jemmy. I'm a business engagement manager at the University of Birmingham, and I support uh, activities uh, helping SMEs access the research and support that is available at the University of Birmingham. And I'm here this morning with a lovely panel of lovely people to talk about uh, research and development within the food and drink industry in particular. It's an area that is completely under the spotlight at the moment because of the issues that are facing the industry, a shortage of drivers, shortage of fuel, shortage of CO2, shortages of everything. So it's an industry that is uh, uh, struggling at the moment. And we're here to see if, we, if there's anything that we can do to support that. Um, and the speakers this morning will show uh, opportunities for um, being more efficient, looking at opportunities for uh, further development, but also future proofing as well, which I think is important in these times. So uh, before we start the morning's uh, talks, um, I'll just run through a couple of housekeeping notifications. So we've muted all the de delegates for the duration of the morning, morning's talk, well, we'll finish at 10 o'clock. Um, but if you do have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. If you have any technical issues, please pop them in the chat box and we'll endeavour to resolve those issues. Um, uh, we are recording the session and it will be made available um, afterwards as well for, for viewing and we'll also be circulating the slides after the event. Don't forget that you can follow us on Twitter at UOB Business Club, but also on LinkedIn. So without further ado, I will move over to our first speaker of the morning, which is Dr. Lorelei German from a at Ateta. She is a business engagement officer with one of our SME programs, and she'll be talking to us this morning for about 10, 15 minutes. So over to Lorelei. Hi, good morning all, and thank you, Kate. How are you doing? Um, I'm Lorelei, and as Kate mentioned, I work as a business engagement officer on the Ateta project at the University of Birmingham. Ateta is an SME support program based within the Birmingham Energy Institute. We are funded by the European Regional Development Fund, which means that the support we can offer is free to businesses and charities. It comes out of state aid. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Ateta is an SME uh, support program, as I've mentioned. Uh, what we can do is offer support in the adoption of low carbon sustainability and energy efficiency technologies as we're trying to help industries to decarbonize and we're also trying to help companies uh, achieve UK net zero. What we can offer is support to businesses or charities across the West Midlands, so in the Black Country, Worcestershire, uh, Coventry and Warwickshire and GBS lab areas. Since we started running in 2017, we have supported more than 170 businesses. So how does our program work? Uh, we offer low carbon and energy expertise through our team of nine experienced research engineers and their academic supervisors. So this is a very big team, um, essentially nine academic teams. Uh, they have all worked on industrial projects. So they're uh, trying to bring academic and innova um, innovative solutions to industry. And they can work with you to identify ways to improve efficiency, identify new market prospects, test and demonstrate new ideas such as new products um, and ultimately this will help you uh, grow your business. We can offer technical support across mechanical, chemical and electronics engineering and to, um, to this date the program has succeeded in generating a net income of almost 25 million pounds for the local economy. So I'm going to be discussing a little bit about the main technologies that we could offer companies because I believe this is at the core of what we're trying to present today. A number of food and drink manufacturing businesses uh, can have a number of challenges around sustainability, low carbon and energy solutions. And I, I'm an engineer, so I tried to imagine what kind of challenges you could come up um, or you could have in your business. And I can summarize it around three main uh, core areas. Uh, thermal solutions, uh, electrical solutions, and fuel or mobility. So um, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to describe a few of the um, um, solutions we could be offering um, support on uh, technologies with. Uh, a large part of the work we do is thermal uh, work. So ATAT actually stands for Accelerating Thermal Energy Technology Adoption. This was the, the name when the project started in 2017. And now we cover a few more technologies. 
Um, on thermal, basically, we mean anything that is cooling and heating. So we can look at the energy that any company has in either cooling or, uh, for example, refrigeration or freezing or an air conditioning system. And we can look at how we can capture some of that energy. Likewise, for heating technology. So you can look at uh, low, medium or high temperatures. For example, low would be a boiling water. So anything under 100 degrees. Um, any gas fired burner, even for heating up a room, would be a medium uh, environment for uh, temperatures. And then we've also tackled higher temperatures, uh, but they're used particularly in heavy um, industry, for example, in metal forming. And that is the first um, picture right there on the slide, uh, Samos Forge. So we can look at how can we capture energy either from cooling or from heating processes, which a number of uh, drink and uh, food manufacturing companies will have. So we can re uh, look at capturing it, but also storing it. So it can be anything from um, low, um, um, short time duration storage to long time uh, duration storage. So capturing natural waste heat from the, uh, for example, the heat that is lost to the environment when you're boiling water. So then it reaches room temperature and you can do it through materials, either phase changing materials or through water, through ice. Then you can look at uh, storing the energy and utilizing it when it is either needed during another process, another room, for example, you can take it um, in an adjoining bay or in a warehouse and heat up that space, or you can you look at how you can reintegrate that energy that saved power back in the cyclic process, for example, during heating water. So then you effectively lower the energy consumption for the next cyclic processes. And this in effect, what it does is lower your energy consumption for that process. And it also decarbonizes your enterprise. So capturing, storing and utilizing energy from heating and cooling is something that we uh, is at the core of our skill set. In terms of uh, looking at how the energy, uh, how let's say heat is lost to the environment, we can also offer thermal energy analysis. So investigating the thermal um, transfer of energy to the environment. So this heat loss during boiling water or helping how to uh, better utilize that energy, for example, using better insulation, either for boilers or for refrigerators. This would can help uh, retain heat or energy during operations. So again, it would need uh, less power input and it could help lower the energy bills. Um, one novel um, solution, which I'm sure a number of companies would not have heard of is combined heat and power. So sometimes when you're looking to capture energy, you actually generate some power um, as a side effect, as a byproduct. So you can actually look at capturing the byproduct power from a power generating process. So that's combined heat and power CHP. Um, another big part of the work we do is on electronics. So we, in trying to achieve low carbon and sustainability, there are a number of solar and other renewable power, such as wind turbines that can be used um, in an enterprise. Our electronics team can help you um, look at how you can capture, store and utilize the energy from the renewable source. So, for example, looking at long term storage of energy from solar power, we're doing this work with uh, currently with the charity that uh, wants to install solar panels uh, in a park. Um, and it's about how do you manage the system? So even outside of renewable powers, you can still look at um, how do you use uh, electronics monitoring equipment to uh, do an operational assessment um, and to design better, more efficient systems. So for example, you can use monitoring and control systems in farming such as aquaponics, hydroponics, or renewable energies. And by making for a more energy efficient system, you will save power, you de will decarbonize. And besides thermal and electronics, I've mentioned fuels and clean mobility. So a number of food and drink manufacturing companies will have, let's say, uh, bio waste after the brewing process or after the food manufacturing process. And for example, in brewing process, if as I've heard from a number of clients that they use that byproduct, um, that let's say spent grain as feedstock for farm animals. And that's a definitely a circular economy solutions. However, if there are a number of companies which have the same bio product, uh, by, um, byproduct uh, from their processes, they can look at utilizing it to generate energy from waste. So there are a number of companies that look at processing bio waste and then they can produce electricity and all energy. And um, not just that, they can produce clean fuels. So you can look at how do you, um, you have bio waste after the brewing uh, process, this spent grain, for example. You can then pyrolyze it, burn it and 
those can give you char oil, a number of different products that you can further use and commercialize, but you can also become a source for ammonia and hydrogen. These two are highly carbon negative uh, gases. So they can be used in any gas powered uh, burner, for example, in a boiler, in a furnace, uh, anything that runs on natural gas. By using ammonia or hydrogen in combination with natural gas, what you can do is not just make your uh, process carbon neutral, but moreover, because these gases are carbon negative, they help you carbon offset some of the carbon that you're producing in your operations. So you can basically build a better circular economy model by becoming a source for uh, green fuels yourself. And there is a big demand on the market currently for hydrogen and ammonia. So this is a very timely uh, type of project. Um, these alternative fuels, uh, they use um, using carbon negative fuels to decarbonize ga uh, gas field equipment uh, can help you decarbonize an entire area. For example, a circular economy model in a farm site of a number of companies um, that uh, look at uh, processing their waste. So the type of support we can, uh, and we can also do um, support on mechanical engineering uh, or um, design such as tribology friction and where if you have an equipment that um, operates and there is a problem, let's say, with where in time we have a tribology team which can look at it. So basically the type of support we can offer in Ateta is of a minimum of two days of funded activity free to the company under state aid. And this can be anything from modeling and simulation. So looking at your power consumption, for example, we can do material testing to try to analyze um, how biodegradable is your project or what can we do with the product at the end of its life. We can help with product development for green products. We can also do systems engineering design, but we can, and this can be electronics design or mechanical engineering design or chemical engineering, which is thermal essentially. Uh, we can also do lab work and analysis um, and let's say commercialization and innovation support. This can be market assessment for a new product or uh, technical economic analysis for um, let's say EV powered batteries. Um, something that we have done is not just offer Ateta support, the three days of support we can, um, um, the companies can use directly, but also we have tried to enable the development of a relationship with our academic colleagues, the nine research teams, which we have available on Ateta. So this can promote um, more uh, collaborations in, for example, scoping out funding. And a great example is the low carbon and circular economy fund um, um, developed um, for the West Midlands by the GBLS lab. Um, so this is something that we have applied for before and we have used for industry to um, develop low carbon solutions. This can uh, mean that you can enter into long term collaboration with the ATETA academics. You can also source funding for, to develop some of the solutions um, you're looking, uh, you're envisioning to adopt um, a sustainable models at your company. Um, and this can bring more benefits ultimately to your business. So you can use some days of data support and then you can further apply to more funding that will help you build, for example, a demonstrator for that solution. And one uh, additional type of support that I have not mentioned, but it's extremely um, in high demand on the market at the moment is carbon footprint uh, analysis. Um, next slide, please. On carbon footprint analysis, we have produced carbon footprint tools for either products or processes for a number of products. So Dr. Amutar Joshi, our colleague, has done it for an electronic bike, for an e-bike, um, hybrid shredding machine for waste material, or even for sleeping uh, bubbles. Sleeping bubbles have been extremely happy uh, that thanks to the support they have received from our team, they were able to, ex uh, to essentially introduce a new low carbon service for their customers. So they have had a good experience and they're currently using their tool. Likewise, the e-bike carbon um, footprint tool that uh, our colleague generated for, um, the for another company, Nokomoto, um, was, um, um, was possible to um, uh, basically produce a new type of process um, for um, the company to use as an additional tool for the customers to look at the carbon footprint that uh, they are saving through using the e-bike. Next slide, please. So essentially on Ateta, we have a number of different types of project assists which your business can use. And they, um, this can serve to develop low carbon solutions, make for energy efficient processes and essentially help you grow your business. So get in touch with our team to adopt these solutions and we can help you reach UK net zero. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Lorelai. That was fantastic. And just a, a kind of a, a, a note, uh, Lorelai will be speaking at Birmingham Chamber event on Net Zero next week, next Thursday morning at 10. So do look, look that up. Thank you very much, Lorelai. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Adriano Scovelli, who is going to be sharing his screen now and sharing his slides. Lovely. Yep. Okay. I'll leave All it right. over to you then, Adriano. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I will uh, yeah, spend uh, uh, 10 minutes or so to uh, give you some uh, example of uh, the actual work that uh, uh, at the School of Chemical Engineering we have carried out within uh, a TETA project that uh, Lorelei has uh, uh, presented in a very, very clear manner, and just give you some, uh, some example of uh, the engagement type of activities and impact that we are uh, uh, basically performing here at the University of Birmingham. And I will focus on uh, the thermal aspect that uh, Lorelei has mentioned, um, with uh, essentially the objective to, uh, uh, to give you a little bit of an overview of what we do and hopefully uh, spark some uh, uh, some useful uh, conversation about how you can engage uh, with uh, with us with the broader team that is here uh, today. So um, I would like just to take it uh, from the uh, perspective of the uh, um, let's say industrial decarbonization strategy that was published uh, some time ago. And as you might also appreciate it from the previous presentation, we expect uh, um, so to say range of uh, activities and interventions. Uh, that are necessary to reach uh, net zero in, uh, uh, let's say, in the industrial environment, uh, in uh, all possible industrial energy intensive industries, in particular the food and drink sector. So uh, in particular, in two key, uh, key areas, uh, physical assets, so hardware technologies that actually are either developed or brought to market and integrated in these uh, processes to reduce uh, uh, emissions or produce energy at uh, uh, zero carbon, and in parallel, actually, digital solutions. Digital solutions, as I will mention later, will be essential to manage the increased complexity that will emerge from uh, the integration and development of, uh, of uh, actually uh, physical assets uh, and zero carbon technologies into the process. So I will give you a couple of examples of both, uh, uh, let's say, uh, development of uh, yeah, physical assets, technologies, and digital technologies that we have uh, yeah, performed over the last uh, last two, three years uh, here at the uh, University of Birmingham, in particular in the School of Chemical Engineering. So as you probably are uh, very aware, the, uh, um, yeah, the, the carbonization of the uh, food beverages and uh, food industry in general, uh, it's uh, largely a thermal, thermal energy uh, challenge. So process, uh, process heat demand and, and cooling as well might actually account from, uh, depending on the specific process, from 40 to 80 percent of the of the final energy energy uh, demand. Uh, however, at least the, the average statistic shows that, let's say, seven to 11 percent of these uh, energy is only supplied by renewable energy sources. There is a hidden, uh, let's say, resource which are uh, streams of wasted heat and cold, so rejection of uh, relatively low grade. Uh, heat that is currently unexploited and is an area that we have been uh, exploring quite uh, quite extensively and how to, through a storage solution, recover heat that is otherwise wasted to essentially reduce on one side the energy consumption and on the other side uh, reduce also the carbon footprint of the processes and how this can be managed with an increased level of digitalization of, of the processes. So we are in the specific uh, sector talking about solution that probably ranges from relatively uh, low temperature to up to 200 degrees C or so. So I'll give you a couple of uh, typical examples of a uh, solution that might be actually already available and could be uh, taken on board by, uh, by the industry and with also obviously support from uh, technical expertise, for example, from the ATITA project. So uh, this uh, is uh, an outcome of a, actually of a European project, like uh, uh, similarly, data where we have a scope and in, uh, identify 40 possible consolidated and emerging technologies that are already available, most of them already uh, economically feasible if uh, uh, adequately sites and introduced and integrated in the processes that allows to essentially reduce the uh, carbon, carbon footprint and uh, the energy consumption. They span uh, across three, three ca categories essentially, recover of uh, existing energy streams, storage of energy streams and upgrade of energy streams. This means uh, uh, 
utilizing heat that is at low temperature and uh, in a smart and uh, zero carbon way upgraded at higher temperature so that can be reused in the process. So I'll just uh, pick a couple of examples actually in the storage, let's say department and in the heat upgrade uh, department, so to say. In particular, to show that uh, we will move very soon or we are already moving uh, from, a, let's say traditional supply and use, uh, um, let's say archetype of processes, traditional and inflexible, uh, where let's say mostly uh, supply is from fossil fuels or electricity based to a highly more complex and flexible uh, system where a key aspect will be the intermediate, let's say, enabler of the carbonization, which uh, are storage option and in general energy flexibility options. This allows to take into account of uh, uh, intermittency in the uh, um, supply, uh, what we expect to see and what we are trying to face and to resolve is the obviously intermittency in renewable sources and both in uh, availability as well as in price so that the supply and the end use can ultimately match them, but we need an extra degree of freedom, so to say, which is often provided by storage, which allows to match supply and demand. And our work mostly focuses on, on thermal energy storage solution, although, as was mentioned before, the uh, electricity storage is also a possible option. So within this, uh, this so to say, framework or new uh, archetype of, uh, of processes, uh, I just want to point out two key uh, options that we have uh, scoped and investigated quite extensively. One from uh, assessment and modeling perspective that is uh, currently available. Um, uh, large scale heat pumps, particularly industrial heat pumps are probably technology readiness level. We are talking about seven, eight, or probably already nine in certain instances where most of the process heat in uh, uh, particularly in food and uh, drink industry. So up to let's say 150 degrees C uh, allows essentially use of green electricity to provide this, uh, this heat by, uh, let's say, uh, large-scale heat pumps working with, uh, uh, with organic fluids. And on the right-hand side, you see a range of actually available existing suppliers of this technology uh, that uh, essentially allows right now, if properly uh, addressed and investigated, to displace typical ways uh, or traditional ways, fossil fuel ways to supply relatively mid or mid to lower uh, temperature process heat, as well as steam production. And on the bottom right, just from one of our analysis from the previous, uh, from the previous let's say, uh, references in the previous slides, shows the typical, let's say, semi-qualitative comparison between process heat delivered around, uh, let's say, 150, 160 degrees C, uh, assuming a, let's say, efficiency or a coefficient of performance three to four, with this solution, essentially the, uh, um, CO2 emissions can be uh, reduced from, let's say, a unit, uh, let's say 100% from fossil fuel to either zero to 33% approximately, depending on the carbon intensity of the electricity used. And at the same time, reutilize uh, for a good extent, probably 75% or so, the heat that might be wasted by the, by the process itself. So this is a typical example of a solution where we have a, a sort of circular, uh, circular kind of type of thinking, as well as the utilization of uh, uh, zero carbon technologies. However, as I mentioned, fluctuation in the, uh, in the supply often and requires development of new storage solutions. This is an exemplar case of uh, what we have developed uh, uh, internationally in this case uh, with a quite well-known, let's say, uh, industrial partner in a new type of storage systems. And this allows to store heat uh, at approximately 90 degrees C by using uh, dedicated materials, which are called phase change materials. So these are uh, organic substances that melt and freeze around a specific temperature and essentially allows to store heat more compactly, approximately two to three times smaller than traditional water tanks and at uh, isothermal conditions. So uh, at constant temperature approximately, which allows better integration in the industrial processes uh, where there are specific technical requirements in terms of, in terms of temperatures. And ultimately, uh, this allowed the company to reduce fossil fuel, basically uh, reduce quite significantly the utilization of uh, traditional uh, boilers or steam generators. And the next steps in this, uh, in this activity that we are carrying out in this project we are carrying out with, the, with this company will be actually coupling of these uh, thermal stores with uh, the uh, industrial heat pumps that I presented before, so that actually the uh, currently fossil fuel supply of steam is completely replaced by uh, low carbon intensity electricity. 
with the increased flexibility in the industrial processes. I'll spend a couple of uh, more minutes uh, just to uh, touch upon uh, the other area that I mentioned. Uh, with this increase of uh, both uh, technological solutions and uh, um, increased coupling between energy vectors, uh, we expect obviously an increase uh, in complexity of management of the processes. So this is the other key area that uh, we are working on and is essential to, uh, let's say, co-develop with the physical assets is the management of these integrated system where we will see more kind of circular thinking but full integration between resources materials flows and let's say a supply of actual uh, of actual materials and gases and raw resources with thermal energy and the electrical part of the system so in this area and just take a couple of minutes here we are developing so-called digital twins so digital twins is essentially a virtual representation or it's a uh, rep representation of the physical assets that uh, allows to essentially explore scenarios and explore configuration of the system before realize them physically. And ultimately also allows uh, fed by uh, measurements and data to reschedule and optimize and control the actual physical assets in a more clever and smart way. For example, exploiting fluctuations in, in, uh, in energy prices to reduce uh, energy costs, but also improve energy efficiency overall. And, is uh, my last slide is an example of a, again of a uh, let's say intervention or work with an industrial company that has the steam uh, demand currently used with traditional uh, steam boilers where we have uh, replicated the process with the digital twins that also included uh, the storage options thermal storage option uh, uh, similar to the one that I mentioned before and we investigated essentially the investability and the uh, operation of these uh, of this system if the storage was integrated. And what we found is that the overall capex could have been reduced by approximately 50%, essentially by uh, reducing the size of the uh, supply technologies. And the operational cost can be also reduced dramatically because essentially the supply or the steam boiler can be uh, sites for base load conditions and not for the peak demand. And the fluctuation are handled by the storage system. And this brings me essentially to the, uh, to the last slide, where I essentially reiterate and emphasize what Lorelei has also, has also mentioned. We are obviously happy and interested to uh, engage to uh, uh, provide a range of possible, uh, possible services and within ATITA by obviously uh, academics like myself, but the wider team that is available here to obviously kind of test and demonstrate innovative ideas, assess your processes and to identify opportunities for enhancement in, in efficiency, and ultimately uh, develop new uh, product processes that allows to, to reach net zero carbon in a, well, in a just way and in an uh, economically affordable way as well. Uh, so yeah, that's all from my side. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll pass to, to Kate. Lovely. Thank you very much, Adriano. And uh, just to uh, let the businesses on the call know, we've just recently had some funding awarded under the Knowledge Transfer Partnership Scheme with Adriano uh, leading uh, for a company called Eskimo Designs, who are actually based in Birmingham. And this is to look at um, thermal energy storage project. So it's a very exciting opportunity and a very relevant one. I actually just have a question before we move on to Sean, if you don't mind, a uh, question that might uh, that might be pertinent for Lorelei and Adriano, a question from Tom Rowland um, for organisations who aren't in the food and drink, uh, food and beverage sector, but do have extensive on site catering facilities as part of their operations. Uh, are there still actions and initiatives that can be applied to reduce carbon and energy consumption? So basically the uh, approaches that have been covered uh, already by Adriano and Lorelei, can they be scaled down? I've said in short yes, but I thought I'd hand over to the experts just to uh, answer that, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, yeah, so anything where you have a power consumption, electricity can be investigated and looked for where we can make some power savings. So again, it can be anything from uh, a better monitoring and control system of the electronics. It can be yeah, supplying a renewable power, but it, uh, we can look at uh, anything that produces carbon or uh, yes, has a high energy bill and at how we can make it more energy efficient and essentially decarbonize the company. So it's this um, the webinar today is particularly aimed at the food and drink manufacturing industry, but we uh, cater to a number of different industrial sectors. So this is definitely something we can support with. 
Yes. Um, if you want to um, drop us uh, an email, Tom, then uh, let us know what your query is. Then we can um, have a, an offline discussion with you about that. Um, Adriano, any comments about that as well? Well, no, I just, uh, just uh, let's say, reiterate the same same point. There are a, a range of, uh, of opportunities and options that are definitely scalable. Yeah, we have tailored the, uh, let's say, presentation webinar to a specific sector here, but just to yes. take as an example what Kate has mentioned before, this new, uh, let's say, project that we have on, on thermal storage systems is actually for a relatively small scale, uh, kilowatt scale type of, uh, type of uh, uh, technology. So it's definitely smaller than what... Uh, has been presented here and uh, therefore there is definitely room and necessity essentially to uh, look at the solutions at a broad range of scales and different sectors and application and definitely there is a, a broad range of expertise and, and uh, knowledge uh, in, let's say in the team here and broadly in the, the university so we can definitely have a look at, at different sectors and different applications for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, ultimately, everything is scalable uh, and uh, not just company wise, but the, the research and applications are scalable as well. So thank you very much, Adriana and Lorelei, for that. Um, uh, without further ado, I'll move on to Sean Suku from Winnie's Meals. Sean, are you online now? Ah, oh, lovely. I am. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Sean. So um, Sean has had uh, support from the ATETA program and uh, I'll ov over to you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Sean Suku. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Winnie's Kitchen. Um, essentially, uh, just a little bit into kind of our background. Um, I used to be a personal trainer and my mum used to cook these ready meals for me to take to work. And um, it wasn't long before people started asking me questions about um, the food that I was eating. So just to make a bit of extra money, I decided to start selling it to my colleagues and then it just became my business. So um, we uh, this business started down south. I relocated to the Midlands uh, two years later to try and essentially make the dream happen because I couldn't afford a, a large premises down south and here I am now um, the Midlands is my home and um, yeah we're trying to scale as much as possible um, but being being an entrepreneur um, especially being an, a young entrepreneur without business minded uh, and experienced business individuals around me um, I felt very kind of isolated and that there wasn't kind of much support available uh, but through the Growth Hub, I was actually introduced to Ateta and um, I was pretty blown away at the support that is available. Um, I was used to having challenges and finding a solution myself and then kind of learning the hard way that there were kind of drawbacks to that solution. And then it's constantly kind of problem, solution, problem, solution. Um, you feel like you're doing that on your own, but there are there is support available. So uh, the challenge that Ateta helped me um, get to the bottom of uh, was to do with our packaging. So we ship, just to put you in the picture, we ship frozen ready meals across the UK via a next day delivery service in insulated boxes. So uh, these boxes are lined um, with insulated material um, and contain ice packs and this keeps the food frozen during transit for that 24 hour period. Now, um, the, our first challenge was actually just eliminating plastic. And this is something that I took upon myself um, and managed to do. So uh, we used to use um, plastic kind of takeaway style uh, containers, um, Tupperware containers. And to er eradicate that, I found uh, this uh, this piece of packaging that you can see on the on the screen so um this eradicated some issues that we had i.e plastic when it's frozen is very brittle um and then during transit we we had because you've got the likes of uh, the the careers the national couriers who don't handle your products as well as you would if it was your own uh, delivery drivers um we had a lot of breakages so moving away from plastic had double benefits for us of course looking after the environment which is somewhere we wanted to focus as a company and secondly the fact that we wouldn't incur as many breakages. Now, the issue with this piece of, um, well, this packaging here, although it eradicated those issues and we were doing the best thing for the environment, it raised more challenges that I didn't foresee um, and I didn't experience due to 
quite frankly, not enough testing from my my behalf and not having that kind of scientific background um, to really be evaluating these decisions properly. So uh, the, the issue was, as the food started to slowly thaw during that transit, uh, the, uh, the, the food being transported across the UK, um, this being a paper-based um, food cart and actually started to get a little bit soggy. So um, in some cases, um, it led to customers after them heating up their food, um, it, uh, the, the container leaking and, and that kind of thing happening. So being a company that, yes, we've just eradicated plastic now, we're doing the best thing for the environment, we've brought in this new packaging, now this is where we are, and it's now not, it, it's it's got rid of one issue but then brought in another um i was stuck so um a tessa come along to the rescue so um we needed to find a solution uh, i was adamant that we are not going back so we're not going back to plastic that's not an option so we need a plastic free container that is more robust than the container that we're using at the moment. But the other properties it needs to have is it needs to be microwave um, friendly, it needs to be freezer safe, um, and ultimately it needs to perform all the jobs that we need uh, to perform. So, um, sorry, just next slide, please. Um, Ateta found uh, this solution for us. So um, this container um, is actually made from sugarcane pulp. So it's actually sugar cane, uh, the byproduct of the uh, manufacturing of, of, of sugar. Um, the pulp that remains is then woven into fibers and it, it almost has a feel of um, like an egg carton in terms of strength. Um, but what this then eradicated was any kind of issues that we, we had in, um, it was a lot more robust. We didn't have um, leaking containers. Um, it also wasn't brittle like our previous plastic container and it and it and it ticked all of the boxes for us so a teta uh, it was just absolutely fantastic um, they were super efficient uh, super fast they um, we simply had an initial meeting I uh, went through kind of all of my pain points and um, areas that we needed addressed um, they went away and whilst, whilst I was able to continue with usual business, uh, this work was being done uh, behind the scenes um, and then uh, the next call uh, was um, to present their findings and this was the solution that was presented. Um, I was given all of the um, technical specification, where I could find it. Um, even a cost analysis in comparison to what I was spending before. So I knew the kind of cost um, implications of, of, of moving over to this solution, um, where I could source it from, um, where it is originally manufactured. All of this information was presented and all, I, all it cost me in terms, of, um, in terms of my resources was an initial call, um, which probably took half an hour to an hour, um, and they went away and found this amazing solution. So um, it, it really has put our company in a, in a much, much stronger position because, of course, the, the core of what we do, um, we're now 99.7% um, um, by weight um, plastic free um, as a company um, in terms of how we ship our produce to our end, uh, end customers. Uh, this uh, is actually better than even what I asked for, because it's also oven safe as well, which wasn't something I originally um, required, but giving people that further kind of flexibility um, in how they actually enjoy our product is, was a great value add. So I'm eternally thankful uh, to Ateta for their work because being a young entrepreneur, you do feel as though it's you against the world and without kind of understanding how these things work and the support that is available, um, it's been a godsend uh, coming across Ateta. And um, since then, uh, there's been other projects as well. Um, I'll just talk very quickly about, um, it's sometimes not just about moving uh, from one uh, solution to another. Sometimes it's about ruling out um, potential um, avenues and, and actually confirming that maybe they're not the way to go to. So um, we looked into um, something called a retort process 
um, which would mean um, they're basically shelf stable ready meals on the market now where they don't need to be frozen they don't need to be refrigerated um, and we wanted to explore that as a company to reduce our potential energy costs um, save because in within our company we have a hell of a lot of um, like big walk-in freezers which of course consume a lot of energy and then because our model is frozen food um, to get to transport our goods to our end customers is very expensive purely from an insulation perspective so if there was a way in which we could eradicate the freezing process eradicate cold um, holding of food um, and not have to send our food insulated it could potentially have some huge savings um, Ateta um, came in uh, to look at this project for us I didn't know where to start in terms of how can we retort or essentially can uh, our food so that so that it, it can be shelf stable uh, and ambient uh, temperature stable um, they did all of the research and we actually found that they again came back with a report this is uh, what uh, this is what this uh, process entails this is the equipment that you need to be able to buy this is the energy input because of course although we're saving energy in storage with with freezers this is the amount of energy required to to put food through this pasteurization process to actually get it um shelf stable um and what we then found was as a company and a small company where we currently are um there were two the one the initial investment was was vast but two the amount of energy required uh, to input into this process it was neither here nor there whether there would be an overall energy saving um, and with that kind of uncertainty it just made it very um, it, it assured us that the, the right decision to make was actually to stick with our existing uh, business model and not progress so um, definitely uh, again with that research would have taken me a hell of a long time um, and I probably wouldn't have got, in fact, I can guarantee I wouldn't have, uh, the findings I would have found wouldn't have been as conclusive. And I probably would have found out the hard way, the amount of energy that we would have had to input um, at the, yeah, in order to, in, in order to process our food in that way. So um, a teta, fantastic in knowing where to go, but also where not to go. So um that's pretty much uh, everything from kind of my experience but um my my advice to anyone is just tap in just 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 really that we're, we're very very fortunate to have these kind of um this kind of support available and it's been hugely beneficial for me so i couldn't recommend them enough John, that's fantastic thank you very much uh, a great uh, soundbite to end on um We've had a, a couple of kind of comments, not questions per se, but a couple of comments. Somebody wants to uh, get in touch with you, so we'll pass that on uh, after the after the event. Um, Abdul Gadrad said, uh, why have McDonald's not adopted this idea? This is brilliant. Uh, and we've had another comment about um, would the packaging be suitable for pre-cooking and storage? But I think Lorelai's uh, answered that one. So absolutely fantastic. And just to, to re reiterate, really, the, the support that Sean had uh, from a TETA program is replicated another six times because we have another six different projects that are in different sectors that can support any SMEs uh, in the West Midlands, in, in most sectors as well. So, and there's no reason why you can't have one project uh, with a TETA and then another project with another one of our support programs. So Sean can easily um, have support from uh, another program and and uh, and uh, other areas of support as well. So thank you very much, Sean. I know you've been really busy this morning. I can hear the noises in the background. So we'll uh, we'll say thank you very much. If you're able to stick around for any further questions, that'd be great. But I appreciate that if you're, you're a busy man this morning. So thank I'm you very to, much. I'm happy to stick around. Excellent. Thank you so much. Right. So without further ado, we need to move on to uh, Craig, the lovely Craig O'Donnell from uh, GBS LEP. We'll be talking about some funding that you can uh, apply for under the, their scheme. So over to you, Craig. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good morning to everybody. Um, my name is Craig O'Donnell. I'm the account manager for food and drink at the uh, Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership Growth Hub. 
which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so we abbreviate it down to the GBS LEP Growth Hub. Can I have the next slide, please, Chris? Thank you. Yeah, so um, it, it's interesting. In a world that uh, many of us describe as, uh, as a global village, operating inside such tight borders seems strange, but it, uh, it does turn you into a bit of a regionalist. Uh, I guess it puts into practice the phrase circle of influence versus circle of concern. Our organization serves as more areas than a name would suggest, uh, which you can clearly see from the map. To sort of clarify, the, the LEP is responsible for policy and governance, uh, but the growth hub is the customer facing and service delivery arm of the organization. Uh, we're made up of uh, a team of business advisors, the account management team, which we'll get to, and uh, we also have a skills and apprenticeship hub. So uh, next slide, please, Chris. So we have, um, we have 10 full-time account managers specializing in the sectors you can see on your screen. Most of us joined around 13 months ago and, uh, and because of the world that we live in, uh, we've only met in person for the first time, probably seven or eight weeks ago. Actually, there's someone missing there. That's, uh, uh, we have, a, we have an, a, an 11th account manager, the name of dear David Tomlin, who was in the creative industry side of things. And another uh, honorable shout out, uh, that's me in the corner at the bottom above me to the right is my colleague, Will Broad, and uh, he's our in-house specialist for the low carbon sector. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this, is, this is our core suite of support services, uh, but it's fair to say things got uh, broader support-wise when, when the growth hub brought on uh, the account managers. They told us to go out, which in our case was work from home, uh, which we all understand over the last year or so. And the idea was to support local food and drink businesses, um, which sounds great, but it's a very broad segment. I could be dealing with um, someone who's got a hot dog stand um, uh, all the way through to a manufacturer with uh, 200 employees and then every type of food and drink related business in between. So it was a little bit daunting. It made sense to start in manufacturing. A lot of the manufacturers were, were still operational during this last sort of 18 months or so. Um, and it is one of the, the, the key growth sectors for the, for the West Midlands. Recently, we've been spending time with the hospitality sector, which is uh, obviously because that's uh, now all opened up. But what was interesting from the start was the fact that uh, one thing that was common to all the businesses that we dealt with was the topics of sustainability, packaging, and reducing energy usage and waste. In some cases, this was actually born out of the fact that the customers of these business had, had in many cases been asked by their clientele what their green credentials were. Uh, some like Winnie's Kitchen had very clear positions and others were caught off guard a bit and, uh, and needed to make some rapid changes. What's reassuring about this is that businesses and the consumers are, are driving things forward towards a low carbon future. And with all this activity being legislated at some point, it does make sense for businesses to get ahead of it now. I can have the next slide, please. Uh, okay, not much more to add to this slide, um, other, than the, other than the fact that uh, we have access to over 200 partner providers, uh, each in their own way, supporting local businesses. When the opportunity arises, we will uh, refer a business over to those best suited to, uh, to their needs. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, Hopefully you're already aware, but uh, applications are now open for the West Midlands Low Carbon and Circular Economy Grant Fund. I'm not sure who comes up with these names, but um, they, they do really roll off the tongue. I, I guess it is very descriptive, which is good. There are eight grant funds available for partnership bids, all around the themes of uh, food waste, decarbonisation, sustainable packaging, and, uh, and low carbon in general. Excuse me. Uh, the fund won't cover capital, but it will cover the exploration of ideas. Uh, for example, market research and feasibility studies. It's a great way to see if your low carbon projects or ideas would be effective. And by teaming up with a local low carbon business, you could do all the research basically with no financial risk to yourselves. Uh, we did have a, a networking event held at the Bir Library of Birmingham last Tuesday. We invited low carbon businesses and food and drink manufacturers. To, uh, to come along and meet each other. Like many of you, uh, I'm sure, uh, being around actual people, 
was great and the uh, the event went down very well so for more information you can visit our website and, uh, and please don't hesitate to get in touch with uh, with any questions regarding the fund uh, next slide please the uh, the GBS LEP has partnered with with Zella uh, a new platform which helps businesses monitor measure manage and amplify their sustainability journey in one place it provides easy access to sustainability services, support, advice, and opportunities in the local area. We'll, uh, we'll skip the, the video for now, but I, I know that the team are going to share out the, the slides afterwards so you guys can catch up with that afterwards. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, the recruitment is taking place from September to October 21 and is open to 100 SME businesses based in the GBS LEP region. It's available to all sectors. So if there's anyone on today who isn't in the food and drink uh, sectors, please feel free to come and check this out. Uh, from October to, to November, we'll be onboarding businesses on the platform. And this process can take up to six weeks or, or as little as a week. But uh, it involves helping businesses set up their profile, create case studies, and learn about the functionality of the platform through webinars and how to videos. Next slide, please. The GBS LEP is recruiting a uh, hundred businesses across the region who will be granted a year's free access to the Zella sustainability platform. Businesses interested in participating into the trial are invited to complete the expression of interest. And uh, again, copies of the slides will be provided for those attending for you guys to follow that link. So um, next slide, please. Okay, race to zero. Uh, it's all very well talking the low carbon talk, but you also uh, need to walk the walk. So the GBS LEP has signed up to the UN backed global campaign Race to Zero, effectively being an SME ourselves. We have joined with the SME Climate Hub, which also happens to be uh, UK government backed. Uh, we have signed up to become net zero carbon, net zero carbon by 2030. In the options that were presented, this was the earliest and toughest target that we could actually select. So within one year, the GBLS LEP will have to submit an action plan on how we're going to achieve net zero carbon when we take into account scope one, two, and three of emissions, which are direct emissions from lighting, powering, computers and monitors, heating and transport, as well as the services and products that we bring in and the waste that we generate. Once we work all this out, we will then be doing two things. Firstly, directing our emissions over time, sorry, reducing our emissions over time. And then secondly, we are likely to be looking to use an offsetting scheme, which is where we invest in local green infrastructure schemes, so planting trees, et cetera, uh, which causes a real increase in green infrastructure, but will also absorb the same amount of emissions that we produce. Uh, so we urge uh, local businesses to look into Race to Zero if you haven't already done so. And next slide, please. So um, as mentioned, food and drink manufacturing is one of the strengths in the West Midlands. Uh, through partnership working, the GBS LEP is leading on the, uh, wait for it, this, this is a great title, the West Midlands Local Industrial Strategy Sector Recovery Plan for Food and Drink Manufacturing. The plan covers the Greater Birmingham and Solihull LEP, Black Country LEP and Coventry and Warwickshire LEP regions. In 2020, the GBS LEP launched the West Midlands Food and Drink Manufacturing Forum. It's an advisory group of local West Midlands businesses to feedback on our delivery and to ensure that our recovery plan objectives continuously reflect the needs of the sector. The forum is an excellent opportunity for businesses to network and gain regional recognition in the West Midlands uh, food and drink manufacturing space. If you're a food and drink manufacturer and interested in joining the forum or want to learn more about the sector recovery plan, please contact me after the meeting and I'll make the introductions. Next slide, please. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all this morning. And uh, thank you once again. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, so we will be circulating the slides uh, afterwards. So all those links and uh, details will be available to you after, after this event has concluded. Um, so it, um, I do have a couple of questions actually. So for Sean and perhaps for Lorelei as well, actually. Um, so a question from Mohammed, uh, the retort process Sean spoke about, what stops the bacteria from growing and making the food spoil? Is it vacuum packed or packed in a non-responsive gas? Well, the, so I, 
I'm I'm just a regular business owner. I'm not a science expert, <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's to do with um, the high high pressure that the food is um, kind of exposed to before it's packaged. Um, it's then put into a vacuum. Um, well, essentially, the container is then a vacuum and not a. So it, 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 that the food can actually be shelf stable for up to two years. Now, in um, in hindsight, and having kind of tested this with um, with the market, um, a lot of people, including myself, don't quite like the idea of um, a healthy meal that they can store in their cupboard for two years. Uh, so that was another one of the reasons we didn't end up going ahead. But yeah, it, it's 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 a process that's it's, it's similar to canning so it's the same reason why a, a can of baked beans can stay um in 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 the can for a, a hell of a long time so um but i'm sure these guys could answer that question a lot better than than i can yes and this is what i was uh, going to suggest i've seen that uh was it dr elena navarro who supported the project we would be happy to arrange for a discussion for a call with her uh, if this is of interest uh to mohammed perfect thank yeah, you that's very helpful thank you very much uh yes yeah, so um please do get in touch uh, mohammed and i think tom as well had questions about the packaging so yes please do um so it leaves me um, with just a couple of minutes. So if I can maybe just quickly answer, ask a question before we close, I think that would be appropriate. Um, so how, uh, what are the processes that generate the most electricity? So how can businesses reduce their energy consumption? In 30 seconds, Lorelei. So some of them uh, can be heating and cooling processes. So whether you're refrigerating, uh, you have an air conditioning system, you know, to keep everything safe and cool, that's a massive source of uh, energy use. And we can look at reducing that or anything from uh, boiling. So boiling water, you know, in brewing processes in absolutely anything, canning. Yes, we can also reduce that kind of energy. So this is uh, really massive across a number of sectors. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so as the time is just a couple of minutes to 10, we will uh, let you all go. But just it um, leads me to say thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you to our speakers um, and thank you to Chris and Ben behind the scenes, making sure this all works. Um, details of our next uh, Business Club event will be published shortly, but make sure you follow us on Twitter at UOB Business Club in order to find out more. And also, if you have any suggestions for topics for future events, please do let us know because that would be super helpful. We always want to make sure that we are um, up to date and answering questions that are of interest to industry. Um, so uh, follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next event, maybe in person, but who knows? We'll see. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Bye bye.